why can't it ever be easy? <laughs> Whenever we have something go wrong in the lab, it's almost always more complicated than you think. Simple problems you fix immediately. The hard problems are when there's multiple things happening at the same time that often cancel each other out and make your life miserable. So that's what's happening here. What I thought was the front window leaking actually has nothing to do with the front window. The, fr the dilution unit of the fridge actually developed what's called a superfluid helium leak. So helium-4 becomes a superfluid, which means it can creep up walls without friction, and it can find tiny little holes too small for gas to go through and get through. And that's what it's doing. This is a design flaw, or more like a manufacturing flaw in the fridge. Luckily, Blue Force, the company who made the fridge, has been really great. They have shipped us out a replacement dilution unit, and they're sending a technician under warranty to come and uh, help us do a um, basically a heart transplant on this dilution refrigerator on Thursday. So we got from straight from Helsinki this uh, dilution unit, and I am going to now unbox it for you. And then on Thursday, we're going to install it and hope to get it working. Actually, I have no idea what to expect in here. So, ooh, very fancy. All right, are you guys ready? All right, time to get gloves. Here it is, the beating heart of the dilution refrigerator, the dilution unit. We can pull it out, take a quick look. All right, so there is this bellow here. Gas comes in here. This bellow is for vibration isolation. This is the still. Um, and uh, I don't know where the gas gets injected. This is, the, this is the stepped heat exchanger. This is where it gets cold. Uh, this is the still up here. So it looks nice. Maybe this isn't the heart of the dilution refrigerator. It might be the guts, because this is, this is what uh, takes the gas and pipes it around and makes it work. So very critical component. So on Thursday, we install it. OK, so here is this, the uh, dilution unit. That's what we're gonna be replacing. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but apparently it's in a groove here. So we have to move this up in order to make it work. So in order to do the replacement, we need to take out a bunch of stuff. So first we need to take out all the wiring between the still and the mixing chamber. So here you can see that um, these are screwed in. So I, I think I can unscrew these, just take off the connectors here and remove this as a unit. Then um, I need to remove all of our experimental hardware right here too. So this is gonna be a little bit of an effort. Oh, first thing though, we have this fiber optic. You can probably barely see it. It's this super thin thread like fiber optic that's coming down. That needs to be taken out first because it's by far the easiest thing to break. So we'll start with the fiber optic and then start taking everything else out. So first step, we gotta free the um, fiber optic, it's being held down by some tape. I'd say there's a highly non-zero chance that I break the, um, that I break the tape, the fiber optic here. So I'm going to try to be real careful. We do have a backup fiber optic, so if I do break this one, we can install a new one. The fiber optic is free. I could take it out of the um, ferrule it's, that's holding it, but we'll try to keep it in, see how it works. It's maybe easier said than done. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think we need to take this apart so that we have a small, easier. We don't have the weight on the end of the fiber optic to deal with. Annoyingly, there's a little glue out from the tape, a little adhesive stuck on the fiber optic. And so it's sticking to random things as I try to feed it out. The fiber optics are one of these things. This is a, they're both more fragile. They're both more robust and more fragile than you'd expect, which is an annoying combination, especially if you get cocky about it. They'll break in a second. But they are strong enough to like pull on and support, I don't know, a little weight. I don't know what the braking strength is of these things. They're not, it, if you're pulling on it as a fiber, it's probably okay. It gets really bad, I think, when it's, um, it doesn't like to be kinked. So you gotta be real careful about that. All right, so we're almost, we're basically out here. So now we can pull it out without stepping on it. Okay, so the fiber's out of the way. Slightly broken, but only about an inch off the end at two inches, not a big deal. All right, so next, I think we gotta take off our experimental setup. So I will remove as many of the coaxes as I can, and then hopefully the whole thing will come out. I have a cool tool uh, for these tight um, things. This, this, kinda, this tool kind of goes in from the bottom unless you take out these um, coax cables. Uh, a lot of this wiring is for these parametric amplifiers. They give us this really nice quantum limited, limited amp with basically as low noise temperature as quantum, phys quantum mechanics allows, but they have a lot of components. One of the things we want to do over the next couple of years is try to um, make those smaller and uh, easier to fit in the fridge and use uh, so that we can use the, the super high quality parametric amplifiers in other places instead of just in um, dilution refrigerators that have a lot of room inside them. A lot of these uh, coaxes are broken. I'm gonna have to talk to the guys about treating the, uh, the G3PO coaxes with a little bit more uh, care. They're, they are very delicate and they break very easily. Okay, so we've now separated the, the, two, the, the two main experimental pieces. Uh, I'm gonna take off the magnetic shield and then we can drop down the parametric amplifiers and then we'll be able to drop off the experimental plate. All right, we'll take off the magnetic shield that covers the power amp. You can now see the power amp hardware. Um, these are the power amps, there's two of them. This is a cavity filter. These are directional couplers right here. So these are all designed to send certain frequencies in the right place and deal with the power amp, which has a high power pump tone. We don't want that microwave power to dissipate where it's cold. So we bring the high power pump tone out up to higher temperatures to, uh, to dissipate it. Okay, so now we can take this off. And it looks like it should come free. So the way we're going to take it off, there's these, there's actually three screws holding it on and that's it. So we should be able to just take these three screws out, theoretically. Wow. All right, there's the para amp um, thing. This thing, this is solid copper under here. So this thing weighs a good 
10 pounds, maybe a little more. I should probably lightweight it. All right, the next is the experimental stage. This one's actually pretty easy, but it uses a um, different size, uh, use a ball driver. This is interfacing with the actual fridge, which means it's metric, I think. So this is M3, yeah, it's M3. All right, so I'm gonna take off these M3 screws. This, this one's quite heavy too, it's even thicker. So I'm gonna be a little careful here about taking these off so I don't get too much torque on this thing. There's the main plate. This is where the device is mount. This is a magnetic shield that goes on it. And on the back, we have some isolators. All right, so we've got out um, our wiring. Now we gotta take out these, um, uh, this part right here. So this is the still. They told us everything between the still and the mixing chamber. So I'm gonna undo these, and then I'm gonna try to pull the whole unit out. We'll see how it goes. That is the last one of the coax is going to the uh, still. So now we can hopefully get this out. So I'm gonna take out this middle one first. See, this is a cool tool. It's just a little screwdriver, Allen wrench kind of thing. You may be wondering why we're, all the screws we're using here are uh, brass. It has to do with um, the amount of thermal contraction you get. Uh, if, you get if you use steel, uh, as it cools down, it doesn't shrink quite as much as copper does. And so if you use steel to hold things together, as you get colder, the, the joints get looser and you get less clamping force. Uh, with copper, I mean, so with brass screws, it's the opposite case. It, it shrinks a little, it, it either shrinks a little more about the same and so the the clamping force of the screws doesn't change as much so it's a nice feature another nice feature is that they're non-magnetic um, a lot of these superconducting experiments really don't like magnetic fields and so even stainless steel fasteners have some residual magnet magnetic field uh, some cop some brass alloys actually do too depends which brass it is but um, what we've learned over the years is that uh, the shiny brass which is basically naval brass is the alloy um, tends not to have much iron in it and is the least magnetic of the um, of the brasses people have tested that all right i've gotten all of the uh, screws from the intermediate 200 millikelvin stage out and yep it's free so what i think i need to do is just take out the the bottom and the top and then we should be good to go um, and Hopefully you can just slide this thing out. Sometimes you need the right tool for the right job. If it's small enough to fit in here, it is perfect. All right. Now I bet there's gonna be a, when we try to remove this, there's actually a jig that they have, I think at the factory uh, to, to remove and install these. I don't have that jig. I think there might be some spring tension from all these spring tension from all these coaxial lines. So I'm going to have to see how it goes.
Okay. Now it should be free. Yep. All right, let's see how it goes. Oh, nice. All right, there's the tower. I'm gonna put that down over here. Okay. All right, one more thing left to do, which is we gotta take out the, um, the niobium tie coax that we installed. These are extremely, uh, these are extremely delicate. So what I'm gonna do is mark them and then I'm gonna take them out the same way I put them in. So the reason I gotta mark these carefully is because each one of these is bent slightly differently. And so if I don't have it correct, they, will, um, they won't go in right. And um, this niobium tie, it tends to work harden. You don't wanna bend it any more than you have to or you're taking, a, there's a good chance that it won't survive. And each one of these niobium tie coaxes costs at least $2,000. Um, this stuff is super expensive. Okay. So now I can uh, take them off up here. The other end of the coaxes. Only one through four are actually currently hooked up because our hemp five actually died. Um, and I sent it back to get repaired. So it's now repaired. So when we do the full repair, we'll put, we'll put the fifth hemp back in. Uh, but for now, I had left it out. Okay. Now we have to remove these screws. This is a clamp basically to thermalize the, um, uh, the coax. So there's a clamp that has some grooves cut in it so they don't, it doesn't crush them. It's kind of loose actually, but that's okay. It was, um, I'm gonna put these here. Cause we were getting down to low temp, we were getting down to like 10 millikelvins, so we must have been thermalizing it okay. So I'll put these here. Okay. This. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna leave them as like this. And I think that might be okay for the amount of motion we have to do. If it turns out that we actually need to remove them more, then I can, then we can take the, um, the whole thing out. But I think that I'll talk to the tech tomorrow, but I think that might be good enough. Cause I think what we got to do is just move this, this thing up to free this from a trapped, from a groove here. I think this whole thing has to go up enough for it to come out. And, uh, I, that should now happen. So I think we're good. All right. So this is it. Um, we're now stripped to the point where we can do the repair tomorrow. I hope if we're not, uh, the technician will tell me and we'll, we'll do the, uh, We'll do the, some more disassembly then. All right, we'll see you in the morning. All right, so the fridge is cooling. We actually weren't allowed to film uh, during the replacement of the dilution unit, uh, but we got it done pretty easily. You basically had to lift up one of the plates and then un, uh, unscrew a whole lot of screws. And then finally there's one solder joint that needed to be removed and then uh, one indium seal that came off. The new one went in, re-soldered the, um, the, the input line. Uh, there was a new indium seal, bolted it all up, and it seems to be working. We're currently at about uh, 25 millikelvin and falling on our first cool down here. Um, so that's great. Um, we're going to let it stay cold over the weekend um, to make sure the superfluid helium leak is gone. But uh, hopefully we're back in business. So on Monday we'll warm up, then we'll install all the, um, all the hardware we took out. And at that point, we're ready to integrate with the spectrograph and get Michelle working and actually take some high resolution spectra with this, with the goal of one day taking high resolution spectra of exoplanets that will hopefully let us see life on nearby planets. So thanks for joining us on this adventure. Like and subscribe. And hopefully next time you see Michelle, we'll be um, putting light from the spectrograph on the array.